on World News Tonight. Set ablaze. Crowds towards churches and homes of Pakistani Christians following accusations of blasphemy against Islam. Choked off. Essential supplies are cut off from Nargorno Karbakh residents as Azbajani blockade drags into its ninth month. Open again. Border activity detected in North Korea as buses are seen crossing borders into the Chinese trains. Pink Frenzy. Pink Frenzy draws Wellington locals and football fans to Barbie exhibit to browse a collection of Barbie dolls. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and you are joining us on World News. We begin tonight in a violence ridden Pakistan. The crowd vandalized eight churches and several homes following accusations of blasphemy against Islam in Pakistan's most populated province of Punjab, stoking tensions between local Muslim and minority Christian communities. Thousands of Muslims in a city in Pakistan have set fire to at least eight churches and vandalized the homes of Christians over claims that two men desecrated the Quran. According to a police report, two Christian men were charged by local police in the town of Jaranwala on the grounds of desecrating the Holy Quran and abusing the Prophet Muhammad. Pakistani Christian communities are regularly targeted with the country's strict blasphemy laws, which activists say have historically been manipulated to persecute minorities and isolate them from public life. Multiple churches, including the town's Catholic Church, Church, the Salvation Army Church and the Pentecostal Church, as well as a local Christian colony were also vandalized and set on fire. In a statement, the Assistant Commissioner of Faisalabad, where the town is located, called for deployment of armed forces to support enforcing law and order, describing the situation as sensitive and vulnerable. Pakistan's caretaker Prime Minister Anwar ul Haq Kakar condemned the violence, writing in a statement on X that stern action would be taken against those who violate law and target minorities. Furthermore, President Bishop of the Church of Pakistan, Azad Marshall, said country's bishops, priests and lay people are deeply pained and distressed by the incident. Two years ago, Sri Lankan man accused of blasphemy was killed by an enraged mob and had his body set on fire. In 2009, a mob burned down about 60 homes and killed six people in the Gorja district in Punjab after accusing them of insulting Islam. Pakistan is among the countries where blasphemy is a crime punishable by the death sentence. The menace caused by wildfires continues. Now, one of the largest cities in Canada's far north is being evacuated amid warnings of a wildfire. The 20,000 residents of Yellowknife, the capital of the Northwest Territories, have been given notice to immediately evacuate. In the town of Hay River, near the shores of Great Slave Lake, a blizzard of ash and embers as flames engulf the surrounding forest. Canada's Northwest Territories are being ravaged by more than 230 active wildfires, with more than 6,500 residents ordered to evacuate. The territorial government has declared a state of emergency, with regional capital Yellowknife declaring its own local emergency as wildfires encroached to within 20 kilometers. So this isn't any photo magic. In Fort Smith, on the territory's southern border, Onlookers are stunned as the sky itself turns a deep orange from nearby fires. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau expressed his solidarity with affected residents as he announced the mobilization of the Canadian Armed Forces to assist. Hundreds of inhabitants from remote villages have been airlifted to safety after roads out were cut off by raging infernos. More than 13 million hectares of Canadian forest have gone up in smoke this year nearly twice the country's previous record, as droughts and high temperatures brought on by climate change contribute to its worst fire season ever. As of Tuesday, officials reported more than 1,000 active wildfires across the country, with more than 670 burning out of control. Starvation as a means of genocide. That is the predicament in which 120,000 residents of nagorno karabakh live in after Azerbaijan blocked the only road leading from Armenia to nargo karabakh severely restricting the delivery of food, medical supplies and other essentials. Food, medicines and other essential supplies are getting harder to access for residents of nagorno karabakh Now onto its ninth month, the Azerbaijani blockade of the breakaway region has caught the United Nations Security Council's attention. Nina Shavardian is a 23-year-old English teacher. She spoke to in a video call from the capital, known locally as Stepanakert. So right now we have also water shortages 
And because of the water shortages and electricity shortages and no gas, the bakeries don't work. So uh, there is not enough bread even in the shops. They try to bake the bread at night. So the queues are happening at night. So we don't have to stay under the sun. Karabakh is internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan, but its population of 120,000 is overwhelmingly ethnic Armenian. Residents have had to tighten their belts since the blockade, eating only what can be produced locally. Even that is hard to get, as farmers lack the fuel to bring their products to market. We don't go to supermarkets or shops because they are closed, uh, because they cannot sell anything, and the only place where we can find food is a local market but because we have no gas and no other fuel um, there are barely any cars left in the whole um, territory of Artsakh. Karabakh was claimed by both Azerbaijan and Armenia after the fall of the Russian Empire in 1917. It broke away from Azerbaijan in the early 90s. In 2020, Azerbaijan retook some territory after a second war that ended in a Russian brokered ceasefire The agreement required Russia to ensure that the road transport between Armenia and Karabakh remained open. Since the ceasefire, that single route, the Lashin Corridor, has been disrupted. In December, Azerbaijani civilians, identifying themselves as ecological activists, blocked the route. In April, Azerbaijani border guards installed a checkpoint. Former chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Luis Moreno Ocampo, has described the blockade as potentially constituting a genocide of Karabakh Armenians. An assertion that Azerbaijan's lawyers say is unsubstantiated and inaccurate. The, the blockade of the Lachin Corridor has a purpose to starve these people. It, the, the, these people, the only way these Armenians can leave is if this corridor is open and there is the food. And they are not receiving food for the last months, so they will die in a few weeks. Azerbaijan has said it is ready to allow supplies to Karabakh via territory under its control, but that the separatist region must be reabsorbed. The Armenian side says the blockade is aimed at forcing Karabakh into unconditional surrender to Baku. Meanwhile, inflation in the UK fell broadly in line with market expectations despite some underlying signs of stagnation, while a drop-off in energy and food prices contributed to a surprise fall in household bills. Worries about persistent high inflation in Britain grew on Wednesday, as key measures of price growth watched by the central bank failed to ease in July. Markets were concerned despite a sharp drop in the headline inflation rate. Officials said annual consumer price inflation cooled to 6.8%, down from just under 8% in June. Wednesday's data was expected by analysts and the Bank of England. Falling energy costs drove the fall in inflation and food prices also eased. However, Britain still has one of the highest rates of price growth in Western Europe. While it moves Britain further from October's 41-year high of 11.1%, it's still far above the central bank's 2% target. There was pressure in core and services prices that the Bank of England is watching closely. Core inflation is important as it removes volatile food and energy prices. It stayed at 6.9% in July and was unchanged from June. Services inflation mostly reflects homegrown inflation pressure from wages and that slightly rose to 7.4%. Sterling went up slightly against the US dollar after the figures were released and it reinforced market bets the UK central bank will keep hiking interest rates. The strength in core inflation is bad news for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. He has promised to halve inflation by the end of the year. That goal is now in question. Over in Hawaii, the death toll from the devastating wildfires in Maui has now risen to 110. And there are videos released by local residents which may capture the moment when the blazes first broke out. A video that might have captured the start of the deadly wildfires in Maui. Oh, this is live right across the street from my house. Freaking power line just went down. Try my little water hose, but... I hear a pop coming from across the street and shortly after thing was just arcing away on the ground landed right in dry grass so sparks and then there was a fire 
He said he saw a fire break out across from his house at dawn on Tuesday, the same time that officials estimated that the initial fire broke out. His video captures images of the fire becoming even larger, burning the dry grass on the ground. Shane True says in just a matter of minutes, the whole place was engulfed by fire. AP News reported that his video has emerged as key evidence of what might have started the fire. There are other videos such as CCTV cameras that captured a moment of a tree falling down on an electric line and a fire starting not long after that. A lawsuit has already been filed against the local electric company Hawaiian Electric. Due to the nature of the disaster, identifying the victims has become a challenge. Only five of the dead had been identified according to officials. Hawaii Governor Josh Green has said that 27 percent of the search and rescue is complete and that he hopes much will be covered by the weekend. The death toll will likely rise as residents of the town of Lahaina say many seniors lived in complexes in the area where the fire hit. The residents told local media that they know only a handful of people who managed to escape, suggesting there might be more victims from the senior complexes. The White House announced on Wednesday that U.S. President Joe Biden and his wife will be visiting Maui on Monday, where they'll meet first responders, survivors, as well as local officials. We'll be back with more world news of the short commercial break. Welcome back. Ukraine defies Russian threats on cargo ships. The first vessel has left Ukraine's port since Russia threatened to attack civilian ships in the Black Sea just last month. A Hong Kong flagged container ship set off from Ukraine's Black Sea port of Odessa on Wednesday. It's a test of Russia's threat to attack shipping after it abandoned a deal last month, allowing Ukraine to export grain. The departure of the Joseph Schulter vessel followed a new Russian attack on Ukraine's grain export infrastructure. Russian airstrikes damaged grain silos and warehouses at one of the Danube River ports, the governor of the Odessa region said, releasing these photos. The president's chief of staff named the port as rainy. There was no immediate comment from Moscow. Russia has made regular airstrikes on Ukrainian ports and grain silos since pulling out of the UN-backed deal in mid-July and has threatened to treat ships leaving Ukraine as potential military targets. On Sunday, it fired warning shots at the Palau-flagged Shukru Okan ship travelling towards Ukraine. Moscow said the captain had failed to respond to a request to halt for an inspection. Kyiv called it a gross violation of international law. Despite the threats, Ukraine last week announced a humanitarian corridor in the Black Sea to release cargo ships that had been trapped in its ports pledging full transparency to make clear they were serving no military purpose. Moscow has not indicated whether it would respect the shipping corridor, and shipping and insurance sources have expressed concerns about safety. Ukraine is a major grain and oil seeds exporter, and the United Nations says its supplies are vital to developing countries where hunger is a growing concern. Two buses have been spotted crossing from North Korea into China, which sources say is likely to be athletes heading to Kazakhstan for a Taekwondo event. Is this a sign of Pyongyang more actively opening up its borders after a long COVID lockdown? Let's take a look. Two buses were detected on Wednesday heading into North Korea from China and back again. Yonam News reports that two buses departed Tandong at around 10.15 a.m., crossed a railway bridge over the Amnok River and arrived in Shiniju, North Korea. By 11.20 a.m., the buses had returned to Tandong three years and seven months since the regime closed its border due to COVID-19. It's unknown who was on board, but multiple sources say it could have been athletes heading to the ITF Taekwondo World Championships taking place in Kazakhstan this week. Pyongyang earlier said that it will send about 100 athletes to the tournament. The North Korean team is expected to move to the Chinese capital city of Beijing on Wednesday and then fly to Kazakhstan after staying at the North Korean embassy. On Tuesday morning, a bus and a van were also seen in Shiniju crossing the border and returning to Tandong later. Sources say it was likely North Korean sailors who were arrested in China for smuggling. One expert says the resume in people exchanges had already been expected, as delegations from China and Russia visited North Korea earlier to celebrate Pyongyang's Victory Day last month. 
Whether or not this was related to the Taekwondo World Championships or not, more movement across the border is likely. People will be able to come and go freely in the very near future. Some experts say there is a high possibility for a group of North Koreans who are residing in China to move back to their home country sooner. These people will likely include international students in China who haven't been able to come back to North Korea due to the pandemic. North Korea has stopped communicating with neighboring countries and closed its border in January 2020 at the start of the pandemic. But cargo train operations were spotted in January last year, and this year, cargo trucks had also been spotted. As the planet reels under hot weather, a new study has indicated that ocean heat waves and ice loss will most certainly become more common in Antarctica. Scientists warn the fragile ecosystem could be irreversible damage if global warming continues to heat up the planet. It's the dead of winter in the southern hemisphere, but Antarctica's sea ice is no longer reaching the great expanse it once did. This July, the ice shelves were one and a half million square kilometers short of their surface area the same month last year. Warm water is melting parts of the sea ice, and there have been strong winds in some basins, reducing the formation of ice flows. Research suggests that a major deep ocean current has been slowing down significantly because of the melting ice. It could directly change the weather we're used to seeing. If the North Atlantic current called AMOC slows down, the Gulf Stream also slows down. The Gulf Stream is what allows Bordeaux to have much warmer weather than Montreal, even though they're the same latitude. Some studies say temperatures have risen enough to trigger the collapse of the ice sheet in West Antarctica already. The melting of this alone would lead to four meters of sea level rise. Moving on to the segment on Road to the White House, where we explore all the U.S. election updates. As former President Donald Trump faces his fourth indictment in Georgia, here's how Republican candidates are approaching the issue of Trump's legal battles on the Capitol Trail. Some of the Republican presidential hopefuls have dismissed the alleged crimes. Others that have criticized Trump's alleged actions in the 2020 election cycle. Candidates like Pence and former U.S. Rep. Will Hurd have been heckled and booed for their comments on Trump while speaking in Iowa. Though Trump has gone after Florida Governor Ron DeSantis on the campaign trail, DeSantis criticized the charges against Trump. He said that the latest charges are an example of the criminalization of politics. He criticized the Georgia judicial officials for bringing racketeering charges against the former president. On the other hand, one of entrepreneur Vivek Ramswamy's promises on the campaign trail is to pardon Trump if elected. In response to the Georgia's charges, Ramsamy wrote on X that Trump should immediately file a motion to dismiss for a constitutional due process violation for publicly issuing an indictment before the grand jury had actually signed one. Welcome back. For more news, let's take around the world in a minute. Chaotic scenes unfolded at Germany's Frankfurt airport after severe flooding from heavy rainfall caused flight cancellations and delays. Severe weather warnings have been issued by the German Weather Service throughout the state of Hesse, with up to 60 litres per square metre of rainfall recorded in parts of the region. Rescuers in India's Himachal Pradesh resumed their recovery efforts, digging through mud and rubble to search for bodies at a temple site that collapsed after landslides. An 11-year-old rape victim was allowed an abortion in Peru after being initially refused the procedure in a case that rights groups say highlights the lack of support for minors who suffer sexual abuse. Tensions arose on a highway in Buenos Aires, Argentina, when a bus unexpectedly burst into flames, causing its passengers to flee in panic. The fire quickly engulfed the entire bus and spread across the asphalt due to fuel spillage, impending the transit to other vehicles. The cause of the fire was an electrical mechanical problem and no people were reported injured in the incident. The main hull structure of the High Angshio 122 or Offshore Oil 122, a cylindrical floating production, storage and offloading unit, was completed after 17 months of construction in Qingdao City. An FPSO unit is a floating vessel used by the offshore oil and gas industry for the production and processing of hydrocarbons and of the storage of oil.
That is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight as the Barbie movie mania sweeps the world and fans flock the Auckland Barbie exhibit. Thank you for watching. Good night.